Hey folks, my name is Colin Smith. I've come to talk to you about um, my experience sort of diving into a textbook named The Structure and Interpretation of Com Classical Mechanics, which is sort of an odd successor to The Structure and Interpretation of Computer Programs, which shares one of the authors uh, and details their work using Scheme, an earlier Lisp variant, to explore um, classical mechanics. And they used it especially to work with the dynamics of the solar system. There's a couple of demos I'm going to try to get to. So if you want to click on something, you could go to the, uh, the link at the top there. And there's some things you can click on, or if you're bored. Um, the, the authors of the book have a quote that I want to read to you, just because since you guys all bought tickets to come to a functional programming language conference, it should resonate with you guys and gals. One way to become aware of the precision required to unambiguously communicate a mathematical idea is to program it for a computer. We use a functional style to encourage clear thinking. The computer does not tolerate vague descriptions or incomplete constructions. Now, reading structure and interpretation of computer programs, SIGP as I'll call it, back in my 30s was kind of a life-changing experience. I had you know, grown up with Unix and C, and then it became C++ and Java. I had never really had the experience of doing anything with AI, anything symbolically, things like immutability, you know, were just not, not taught and not understood, at least by me back at the time. You know, it's interesting to note when you read SIGP that they don't get to mutability until well into 100 pages before they introduce setbang. So it, uh, it was absolutely ready. I came to be at the right time. So if the author of that book wants to teach me physics, I want to find out how to do it too. Well, uh, I don't have any, any physics training. I took the minimum two semesters of physics in college, and so what am I doing here? I thought, well, I do know, I do know LISP really well, so maybe that will just allow me to bulldoze past all the, the things I forgot to study when I was in college, and I'll come out ahead of this. Actually, I find the book to be rough sledding, even if you are an excellent LISP programmer. Um, and plus, it's written to use MIT Scheme, which is kind of an older variant. It wants to use X Windows. It wants to use their own fork of Emacs. It comes with a lot of um, kind of encapsulation that's maybe a little less than the, the cutting edge. So I thought, I have an idea. I love Clojure, or at least I think uh, it's the, you know, the, the inheritor of the Scheme um, energy. So I'll try to port it, and I bet I would learn a lot, both about symbolic mathematics and about physics and about closure. And the answer to all those questions is it absolutely did that, although it did take two years. Uh, I'm going to just breeze over a couple of terms because the subject of Lagrangian mechanics is a big one, and we aren't going to do every variety of every kind of thing, so we're just going to make some simplifying assumptions here. I'll call it path, which is a function I'll call w, which is going to map from time to the coordinates of objects in our systems. And this, uh, the coordinates we use can depend upon the problem we're solving. We understand that this map's going to be differentiable as many times as we like. We believe that from the position of the objects in space, we can find the potential energy. And with the position and the velocities, we can find the kinetic energy, T, of the system. And we're just going to call the, Lagrangi the Lagrangian the difference of these things, uh, L equals T, the kinetic energy, minus V, the potential. All right? We will think of, given the path, W, we're going to call this sort of infinitely long tuple the state of the system. It starts with T, the time. Then we have W of T, the values of all the coordinates of that time. And then you could imagine that we just keep differentiating off into the future, and we're going to call that the state. In the Lagrangian mechanics and Hamiltonian mechanics that we're going to be looking at today, we are content with the first three elements of this tuple, but other problems might require more, and that doesn't break the concepts that we're going to look at today. The main thing to think about, which we are going to take as absolutely given, is the principle of least action, often called more accurately the principle of stationary action. I'll call it the principle of least action, because that's usually what the headings of the text, you know, you'll find it under. It says, well, if we have this Lagrangian, let's forget where it came from. If someone hands you a Lagrangian, they can say, the motion that you observe from this object is going to be that motion formula, that path function w. The one that's right is the one that will make this action integral minimum or maximum stationary. We'll just call it minimum for today. That works for the examples that we're going to use. If you look, though, at L inside that integral sign, which is our Lagrangian, it looks like it's a function of our state, 
okay, which we sometimes call the local tuple of the path W, T, W and its first derivative. So the idea might be, well, I wonder if I can program a computer to do this for me. Can I get a computer to, to uh, solve that? Can we find the W that would minimize that integral? Well, there's a theorem that will help us. Uh, it says that a path that minimizes that action integral I, I saw on the last slide there is also one that will satisfy this differential equation, which is called the Euler-Lagrange equation. Great, if we could convert this into code, we could find the path that objects will take in real life, except it doesn't say where to put the path. And this was kind of the genesis of uh, Gerald J. Sussman and Jack Wisdom's approach to coding this, um, or to approaching this problem with code. Uh, they also complain that, you know, it doesn't seem like these things are even functions of times, or functions of other things that are then functions of time, and aren't you supposed to use the chain rule? And what do they really mean by this? In the papers in which they discuss this, both in, in the book, Structure and Interpretation of computer, computer, excuse me, Classical Mechanics, and other papers, they, they often go to this equation and say, they were lying to you. This is what they really meant. They really meant, we're going to start with the Lagrangian L, and we're going to differentiate, with the, differentiate it with respect to its velocity parameter. And after we have done that, we are going to paste in the function wr path function and its first derivative. And then over on the right, the same thing. We'll partially differentiate L with respect to its uh, argument in the first slot, counting from zero. And then we will paste in w and w prime of t. And then for the left-hand thing, now we have a function of time. So it makes sense to run that through a differentiation with respect to time. And the w that works will be the one that makes this whole thing zero. So we're getting closer to being able to code this because we've sorted out uh, some of the ambiguity that was concealed in the Leibniz notation. All right, well, let's just start coding maybe in advance of uh, knowing what's going to happen. So we're just gonna adopt some conventions here that will turn out to be useful to you if you decide to study the book. We have our function w, which takes time, and it's going to return an up tuple. This is just a vector that represents a column vector. So you can think of up as just a vector that stands upright. If you know physics, you'll, you'll know that there's more to it than that. Now maybe we'll talk about that. Okay, groovy. So if we had W, in principle, we could compute its first derivative, maybe by hand. Um, but let's, let's pretend the computer can also do that, as in fact, we will show. In order to get W into the Euler-Lagrange equation, we would like to have W converted into something that doesn't just give us the coordinates of the path, but gives us that local tuple time, position, and velocity, or t, q, and q dot. So you can see at the bottom line here, we want an up tuple of time. We apply our function w, and then we apply the derivative of w. So let's just pretend we had a d operation that would do this. Um, so really, this all looks kind of scary, but it's actually kind of simple. We start with w, that's our path function. We want to find out which one of those is real. But we don't apply t to it. We don't go down the path to the bottom, we go on the path to the right. We're gonna make up a function gamma that will turn W from being a mapping of time to coordinates into a mapping from time to our local tuple. And that will be the perfectly shaped thing. You can see following to the lower right there. We could apply L to that, our Lagrangian, because that's what the Lagrangian needs. Well, we also need to compute the partial derivatives of the Lagrangian with respect to a couple of its variables, the first and second counting from zero. So, here we are, we're looking at this expression, partial of L with respect to Q. You know, why do we need to know the names of, of L's formal parameters? Is that, is that ever useful to f do a derivative? I mean, if you change those, would you then have to go into race and, and redo the math? Well, if you're doing this on paper and pencil with Leibniz notation, the answer is yes. But in the system of uh, the book, they, they follow uh, Spivak, who in 1965 wrote an influential textbook called Calculus on Manifolds, in which he threw away all the Leibniz curly D notation there, or, or rather the fractional sort of derivative notation, and says, no, 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 when we differentiate things, we're gonna use a subscript to indicate with which slot, or with respect to which slot we want to differentiate. So let's get rid of all those fraction things and rewrite the Euler-Lagrange equation in this form. So slowly we're molding it, right, into something that we can, we can code there. And this just points out that the, the operators on functions pervasively in this book bind very tightly to the functions they operate on. And this is, what we've, this is where we are now. By the way, with this talk, you can interrupt me with questions. That would not bother me at all. 
We're almost there. So now we have something that looks closer to something we can write code with because we're dealing with functions and things that take functions in and return functions out. Remember gamma we created to adapt W to the Lagrangian and partial sub two is, a, is, a, is an operator that will take L and replace it with partial L with respect to Q dot in the Leibniz form. We've got partial one, we're almost done, except we have to get rid of D by DT. And that, that says, go ahead and differentiate this blob, this expression blob with respect to the variable T. So we would call that an expression derivative, and that's a little sad. I wish I had a function derivative. How could I make that happen? It turns out the problem, if you think about it, and you follow the book's uh, exposition is, we have a function of, we have an expression involving T because we have applied um, our function to time too early. So what would happen if we just took the application to T out and did it later? This is a theme of the book. It takes a while to get it. One of the things that makes this whole system work is we postpone applying our functions to their arguments as long as we can. We work in a function algebra. We work with operators on functions. And then when we have data that we want to you know, solve in a concrete way, then we can do the applications. Alrighty. So um, now that we took the application to T out, we can replace that D by DT with the capital letter D, which just means differentiate this function with respect to its only argument. So you could call this almost, if you wanted, a point-free uh, implementation or point-free exposition of the Euler-Lagrange equation. And we could write the code for that. Now obviously, we're leaning on a couple of things here that we haven't written. We don't really have a D function. We haven't written D and we haven't written partial. But uh, Sussman and Wisdom did write those functions for us and, uh, and we can use them and so can you. But the point being is that we now, this function actually, this function here, Lagrange equations, this actually is the implementation of Lagrange equations in this system. It's not fake. It actually works. What makes it work? Well, first of all, we have to genericize the heck out of everything. Addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, sine, cosine, tangent, logarithm, exponential. All these things have become multifuns in closure so that they can take you know, arguments of any kind. So if you apply sine to the symbol t, it comes back unevaluated. It comes back as sine of t. If you give it sine of a number, you'll get the number. Um, I have not namespaced all these things because I want the code from the book to execute basically out of the box. Uh, that you can, you can do that modulo the fact that the scheme way of defining a function is a little different than closures deafen. So define and deafen, you have to fix that yourself. However, closure has destructuring of arguments and scheme doesn't. And this turns out to be a lot more fun. So it's more fun to do this in closure than it is in scheme in my opinion. Okay, so let's try to cook up, let's, what, is, what can we do, okay? We're gonna define our first Lagrangian, L. Um, it's a function of local tuple. So you see I've used argument destructuring here in the red. It's a function of the tuple time Q or the coordinates and Q dot, the derivative of those coordinates. And that's gonna be one half MV squared. That's so easy. Well, what about my path function? I'm gonna need a path function to substitute in. I'm gonna make a literal function. So X actually is an, can be applied to an argument. If I apply a literal function to a symbolic argument, I just get X of T, that's what it will happen. But I can send that function into the Lagrange equations and I can choose the name of my time variable and I'm just gonna call it T. And what will come back is the following expression after simplification, which is part of the system. M times the second derivative of X applied to T is, is the output. And remember with the Euler-Lagrange equations, whichever makes that zero is the thing that wins the, uh, the contest there. So we have MX double prime equals zero, which means that X prime is constant, so we have constant velocity. Now, any physics class would do this one for you, and it's boring, right? You know, you do the calculus of variations, they show you the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. Thank you, we already knew that. It was kind of obvious. We wanna get further. We're gonna go further faster, right? So let's add a potential in here. So now I'm gonna change my L function to say, well, it's the kinetic energy minus good old fashioned MGH, which is one of the only things I remember from taking physics in college. Potential energy is M times G times how high it is above the floor. So I'm just gonna subtract that away because the Lagrangian is kinetic minus potential. So I subtract from my one half MV squared, I subtract MGH, or I just called the coordinate Q like in the last slide. 
Well, I'll call the path y, a literal function y, which we don't know anything about. And what comes back is the following equation, uh, mg plus my double prime equals zero. If you rearrange that, you find out that y double prime is minus g. It almost begins to feel like this is working. So let's give it a harder problem. Let's do the double pendulum here. This is a good old-fashioned physics textbook double pendulum. The coordinates are no longer Cartesian coordinates. The coordinates are going to be the two angles, theta and phi, I mentioned there. We've got lengths and masses. And yes, that bottom bob can spin around freely. It's not impeded by the upper armature of this thing. So could we find the, the, uh, the kinetic and potential energy of this? Yes, with a little bit of trigonometry, right? You can just find, we find y1 and y2, which are the heights of the two masses, and do the mgh and add that together to get the potential energy. The kinetic energy T is slightly more complicated because we have to find the vector sum of the two velocities there, multiplying them by the mass and so forth, right? If we did that though, we could subtract them. Notice I've got minus TV in this system. The genericization of the operators has, has swollen to encompass everything. So sure, you can subtract functions in this thing. You could subtract operators and everything else. Okay, great. So I cooked up my own little macro called with literal functions. Uh, and then we're going to ask for the Lagrange equations for, for this thing there. And uh, because, my, because I have two coordinates, I'm going to create an up tuple of the coordinates, phi and theta. And my time is just called t. And what comes out at the bottom, you'll see, is a down tuple of the two equations, which if all of this were set to 0, then that would be the winning path for theta and phi, because now we have two coordinates, right? Well, OK. Now we have a differential equation, though, that you're not going to find the solution to in a textbook. Uh, I don't think this one has a solution. And if I got this on a differential equations class test, I would know that I was beaten, right? <laughs> but uh, there's another way to attack this, which is numerically. There's a function in the book, which they derive carefully. I'm not going to go into it today, called Lagrangian to state derivative. What does this do? I've given it the same arguments as before, right? Minus t and v. I'm just going to set the masses and the lengths all to one, just to avoid some variableage in the result here. And I'm going to you know, let g be the acceleration due to gravity. And I get this thing out of Lagrangian to state derivative. What do I do with it? Well, it turns out to be just the needful thing. We can imagine our state tuple, which is one of the key concepts of this book. It's time, position, and derivative. So t, our two coordinates, and the dots of the two coordinates. Over on the right, the state derivative is the derivative of all those things with respect to time. So if you look at the first row, t goes to 1 because dt of dt is 1. The phi and the theta go to phi dot, phi dot and theta dot. And then we have an expression which maps the velocities forward in time. That's something you can integrate with any number of tools. And uh, uh, so how, how are we going to integrate this, though? Where do we go next? Well, I did hook this up to Apache Commons Math. So if you want to integrate it that way, you can, and you'll get numbers back. All the tech, all the beautiful equations you see in this thing were generated by the system itself. There's a function called pointing to tech, and it will convert the expressions it gets into tech form. But it occurred to me that if you can convert something to tech, you can convert something to JavaScript almost as easily, or even more easily. So let's take that expression we had in the previous slide and pump it through Arrow JavaScript after we simplify it and do the state derivative and all that. And now I get this expression in JavaScript. Yes, it's ugly. But it represents that big blob of derivative transformation in the bottom of the previous slide. In fact, well, it has all of it, right? If you look at the return statement, the first thing is 1, because dt by dt is 1. Then we have the theta dot v dot. And then we have the velocity transformation in the bottom. OK. Where does all this go in real life? If you're following along here, we can pick a couple of initial conditions. The, the JavaScript that I got out of the last slide, I've pasted into a tiny web app. I can click my things there, and we can go and integrate it, and then see a little tiny animation of this uh, thing. And you know, I really got excited about this project when I got to this point, because this is realistic looking. It does look a bit like how you might expect these things to actually move in real life. And then I thought, well, I wonder what would happen if I made them stand vertically. So I'm going to carefully move these both to 180 and say go. So you might think of this as kind of a test of the numerical position of the system or the computer. <laughs> There we go. <laughs> that was supposed to be a gentle blow. Was... <laughs> Sorry for that sound. I'm supposed to sound like. Anyway, 
I'm going to shift gears now because you, this is a closure conference, so I'm going to talk about like how did I get this into closure? And the answer is, you know, s slowly and carefully, but but delightfully so. I, I could have just mechanically ported the system to closure. I know enough about both languages to say, okay, scheme does this, closure does that. I thought I'll learn nothing by doing that, and it'll be boring. So I, I actually tried to study and understand how the system actually worked, and I wanted to tell you all about a bit, a bit about why closure turned out to be the perfect thing. And I and I actually love doing this, and and. Uh, it was cool, and I hope, I hope you'll give it a try on a, on a rainy day. Um, on the links on the last slide, I, I explained that um, it was actually a little daunting to go into the scheme code for all this, because there's a lot of it. In the system that goes with the book, there's a lot of scheme code, and it, I had to decide where to begin. And I thought, well, maybe, maybe, this, maybe the simplifier, that was the wrong place to begin, because that's very complicated. So I thought maybe I'll do tuple arithmetic, up and down tuples and all that stuff. Um, I messed around with that for a while, but then I found that Sussman teaches another class. He teaches the class that goes with this book, a physics class. He also teaches another class called Adventures in Advanced Symbolic Programming. And the two topics that he delves into are generic dispatch of operations and, uh, and, and uh, data-driven transformation of, of S expressions. And those turned out to be a key by following the, the lecture notes for those, I was immediately able to start working on the system. Um, so I'll, I'll get into a bit about that. I think I'll skip this, actually. So what we, what we really do here in Clojure is everything is a, now a multi-method, right? Certainly times plus and all that are multi-methods. And our discriminator function I call argument kind. And then um, I, use, I have a bunch of def methods, def methods for every uh, operation so that we can multiply two numbers, two symbols, a number and a symbol, a symbol and a tuple, two matrices, a matrix and a tuple, two functions, an operator and a function. All these things can be multiplied. So we enumerate all the def methods there, and we implement them. So the v argument kind returns a, a short vector of the operations there. So I can have, I can deal with the fact that not every operation is commutative, and it depends a bit on the order in which the arguments are given. To give you a bit about what star can do, if I have a down tuple and I have an up tuple, multiplying them, it gives you the dot product. If I have a matrix, and we're not gonna to talk too much about that, uh, I, can divide it, I can divide a vector by a matrix to solve the linear system, which is actually pretty neat. So if you look at the, that second output there, you'll see the determinant of the matrix is hiding under the uh, quotient, so that the, the uh, equation has been solved by Kramer's rule. That, of course, is factorial uh, time. But uh, none of the matrices in the book are bigger than four by four, and so it actually works just fine for them, but don't use it as a general purpose uh, solver there. Functions, if I multiply two functions, I get the pointwise product of the functions. But if I multiply two operators, I get function composition. This is an important distinction that the book relies heavily on. I can multiply two in infinite series, and it gives me the Cauchy product of the series, which I won't have a whole lot of time to get into today. How many of you know about automatic forward differentiation? Oh, well, I get to talk to you a little bit about it. If you study differentiation with Lisp, it's even discussed in, in uh, SICP, they do differentiation with pattern matching. They'll look for patterns in the expression tree and say, okay, if I see a, a star node with things underneath it, I could apply the product rule, or I can pull constants multiplied out. D that kind of differentiation would not work for this application because we need to be able to differentiate a function before its arguments have been provided to it. That being the case, again, we need to delay the application as long as we can. Automatic forward differentiation works by creating a new number system called the dual numbers. It's very much like the complex numbers. In complex numbers, you have x plus i, y. In the dual numbers, you have x plus epsilon, y, where epsilon is meant to be infinitesimally small. So small that if you ever square an epsilon, it vanishes. There are no powers of epsilon beyond the first. To differentiate a function, I've used this, I, so look at where it says, I'm differentiating the function x goes to sine of x squared, okay? I'll apply that to y, but later, the differentiation happens first. The d operator turns a function into another function where we cook the argument by adding an epsilon to it, and we wrap the result with capital E, which says, extract the terms of the result that are linear in epsilon. So let's have a look at how that would work. I apply C, uh, E rather to sine of Y plus epsilon squared. So first we do the squaring and we find we got an epsilon squared out in red so we throw it away. Uh, 
to get from the sign of that thing there, we, we apply that little idea over there that f of x plus epsilon is a lot like f of x, except we add a little bit of its derivative to it, epsilon times f prime of x. Well, in this system, every function knows its derivative. So the sine function knows that its derivative is cosine. So when it gets an argument, a multi, it's a multifunction. And when the multifunction specialization for sine sees that its argument is of type differential, it knows that it's supposed to replace it with uh, that f of x plus epsilon times f prime of x. So we get epsilon 2y times cosine of y squared. Finally, the E operation takes hold and throws away everything that isn't multiplied by a linear epsilon, and so we get the correct derivative out. How does simplification work? This is a long topic. Um, well, this, I should say that the, the system kind of comes from the MIT late 20th century historical uh, project to, to do symbolic computation. Um, the, the idea that they had to do this was to use, to first, to simplify things, you, there are two kinds of simplification the system does. One is cancellation over the fraction bar. In order to make this happen, they convert everything into a rational function, a, a sort of generic polynomial. Then they find the greatest common denominator of the two giant polynomials and divide that out of the top and bottom and then set everything back up the way it was before with the cancellation having occurred. Dividing, or rather finding the greatest common denominator of two polynomials of, with a large number of indeterminates is a lot harder than you might think. And uh, the algorithm I have in the system as in the closure side that you can download today is fairly naive. I use the recursive Euclid method to do this. The system that you get from Sussman and Wisdom uses a more advanced algorithm called Zippel's algorithm which I haven't uh, ported over, A, because I don't understand it, B, because the book that describes it costs $180 on Amazon, and C, I am really sick of dealing with polynomial GCD at this point. It took a long time to get this right, even in my sort of lame uh, there. So once I was done with that, I put it down. Uh, but the more fun simulation that you're probably more curious about is the rule-based simulation. Again, from their class, Adventures in Symbolic Programming, and from the implementation here, they have a sort of a rule-based combinator language where you can describe situations that you would like to replace with other situations. So this top rule is trying to get square roots out of the denominators of fractions. So it's, uh, we use keywords to represent variables, and if a keyword ends in a star, that represents a sequence of, of unknown things that can be matched. So this says, if you see a quotient where there's a bunch of things multiplied on the top and multiplied on the bottom, and somewhere in there, you find a square root of a thing and a square root of another thing. Please replace that with the square root of A over B on the top, and then take all the rest of the stuff you skipped over and leave it where it was. And the rule on the bottom, I bet you'll recognize. This is good old sine squared x plus cosine squared x equals one, and we, we do that there. I have the laundry machine because the GCD simplification to clear quotients of things that exist on the top and the bottom, plus all of this are applied in this giant washing machine thing with many, many other rules over and over and over again until everything stops changing. And in fact, there are many, if you go back archeologically in the code, which is a whole nother topic, you'll find that they've tried many different mixtures of the, uh, of the system until they settled on the one that they, they liked. So, uh, what worked well for closure was it was absolutely critical that you could add behavior to existing objects. In particular, none, none of the system works if you cannot make a new thing act like a function. So the ability to override, or rather to, to implement IFN for a new thing was critical. In the scheme system they send, or use MIT scheme, they have a thing called an apply hook, which is something you can attach to an object and then if the object should ever, after that point, appear in function application position, the apply hook gets dispatched. Not very functional, but it works. For us, we're much happier to implement IFN for the types themselves rather than have to hook it up each time. I love the fact that uh, up tuples and down tuples can be given the ability to destructure as function arguments by implementing iSeekable, I think is the, uh, the implementation there. I forget exactly how it works. We need laziness uh, in order for the system to work well because infinite series do, be, do enter into the book in later chapters. 
To do polynomial greatest common divisor, you absolutely must have large integer arithmetic because the, the intermediate rational function expressions that are generated by that GCD process can have an explosion in the magnitude of the, of the, the coefficients. And there's a, the, the, that's actually a, a topic of research you can read about, not mine, but others. You know, I, this was my first big closure project, or my first closure project of any size at all. So I, has, I hesitated between def record, def type, plain old map, uh, do it in Java. I've, I tried them all, and I'm not even sure at this point that I made the right choices, but I, it was really critical to have a surface where I could pick different things. If I, if I hadn't had the ability to, to quickly shift between one thing and another, I don't know if I would have per persevered, but uh, always there was a fresh, unexplored alternative. And eventually I was able to get all the code in the book to execute, uh, which, which makes me happy. And that was when I decided maybe you'd be interested in hearing about it. Oh, and testing. I have over 1,500 unit test cases. I started doing that at the beginning because you know, I'm in industry and you know the value of testing if you're at all in industry. I could not have completed this project without writing tests from the very beginning. I needed to change representation. I needed to make uh, new decisions and try things out. Every time I would make a change in test broke, it made me happy because I thought you're looking at the right things. Okay, having got to this point, I don't know if I have any more time. I think I have a little more time. I thought I would uh, take you deeper into the book. So I covered a bit about chapter one, which is Lagrangian mechanics. Chapter two is the, the, uh, the physics of rotation, which is fascinating. Um, we're going into chapter three, which is Hamiltonian mechanics. Hamiltonian, in Lagrangian mechanics, you're taught you are interested in the coordinates and the derivative of the coordinates, position and velocity. In Hamiltonian mechanics, you're interested in the coordinates and the momenta that are conjugate to those coordinates. Isn't that just the derivative of the coordinates? Well, that depends on what the coordinates are. With these angle coordinates, you know, uh, m times v isn't necessarily the real momentum, but in Hamiltonian mechanics, you want to know that. There's a clever trick that you can use to turn a Lagrangian into a Hamiltonian. And there's a Hamiltonian to state derivative operation there on the lower left. And these, are, these again, are right there and they work. And what I get on the right-hand side here at the bottom for this driven pendulum here, I forgot to tell you what the driven pendulum is, but you can, you can see it there. This is the Hamiltonian uh, state derivative, right? So I have t and then the coordinate. Oh, there's a, uh, excuse me, a differential equation for the coordinate theta and a differential equation for the momentum p sub theta. What we're going to do is we're going to take a simple pendulum and we're going to vibrate the pivot that it's hanging from with a sine wave. And that will allow us to explore chaos and resonance. The way we're going, oh, excuse me, Eros. The book explains a modern technique for uh, exploring the dynamical states that the system could enter called a Poincaré surface of section. What you do is you pick T, a period of, or an interval of time that you're interested in. And for our driven pendulum example, that T is going to be the period of the drive. Then we, we start, we pick some initial conditions, that's that leftmost blue dot, and we run the simulation through the integrator. And at the time slices bounded by T or selected by T, we're gonna plot the position and momentum uh, coordinates that the Hamiltonian state derivative gave us, and then we're going to smash them all together into like a portrait. It's just a flat portrait there. And so that's what we're going to do over here. I can go back to the driven pendulum example. So on the left, I have the Poincaré surface of section for the driven pendulum. Up here, you can set the frequency of the drive, and over here, you can set how long of a simulation you wanna make there. So by clicking at different points, I'm clicking different Initial conditions. Oh, wait here. I wanted to do that there. Maybe go back here and just do one more slide. I was going to show you. Oh, oh, so the left hand surface of section is pasted out of the book. So I wanted to show you that the code we're getting out of this system is, is, is doing the same job. So you'll be able to see that sort of hourglass shape on the right. The right hand is from a paper by Jack Wisdom on the chaotic motion of Enceladus, which is one of the moons of Saturn. So the people who created this book are actually using it in their own sort of day-to-day -day work to understand um, dynamics, which I think is pretty fun. And it gives me the sensation of having come into contact with, you know, what researchers in dynamics are actually doing today. And that's been, that's been kind of rewarding. Anyway, I'm going to change the drive to 1.8 hertz here. 
I can find it, and click around. And you see, you know, in the center there, the dynamics aren't very interesting, but, but sometimes you'll find interesting little, little cavities of dynamics here. You might notice that sometimes when I click, I get this blue mist. That's chaos. So if I, if I start the simulation in the blue mist, it kind of goes around faster. Um, but there's, there's obviously some chaos here. And at some point, you might see it's a little bit hard to predict that motion. If I click in the center, like in one of these areas, and, and run the simulation, I haven't given it enough initial energy to get very complicated motion out of it there. But what are these, what are these uh, little quartet of lobes over here? This is, this is what you see on the Poincaré surface of section when you have a resonance. If you look at this thing, if you, you can see that there's a correlation between the bouncing of the drive and the bouncing of the pivot, or the ball at the end, right? So the drive is kind of going one, two, three, four, and the pivot's going at half that rate. I'll run it again there. So this is more like a child on a swing. This is what you do when you want to engage with the natural frequency of the system. And you can see that when the drive, say, is at the tip top, that the, the bob will either be all the way at the right or all the way at the left, and not anywhere in between. There's another sort of a symptom you can see. Let's crank the, the frequency up there. And now we get, when, you, when you're in a situation like this, basically it's just going to whip around, right? OK, fine. But if you turn the drive up, a new thing starts to happen in the corner over here. 6.8 is not enough, so I'm going to increase that maybe to 8.4. Now we have something new, which is the stability of the inverted pendulum. It turns out that if you shake the base of a pendulum hard enough, it is stable to uh, vibrate in the upright position like this. And uh, what, I find, what I find is the most fun uh, example on this thing is to go just leave the zone of stability of the inverted pendulum. Maybe I got too much drive there. What happens if we aren't quite there? Let's see if we can get sort of a, where we don't have that do it. You'll see that it almost wants to stay up, but not quite. Nope, it's not going to do it. No, and actually sometimes when you have the chaos, when they have the chaos, if you have that blue mist, sometimes it will get up there and stay there for a while. But then chaos takes over and it will, at some unpredictable time in the future, it will fall back down. Where could we go next? I've got like three minutes left, so I want to take some of your questions. I'll say one thing. The authors wrote another short uh, book. They distributed a PDF called Functional Differential Geometry, which I should have spelled out on the slide for you. And it takes uh, this system and uses it to study um, uh, special and general relativity, which I, th which I would love to know more about. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Boy, did I wish spec were around when I started, or had, were around when I started this, or that I understood it. Because the scheme code, they don't have any concept of type at all. You know, you might, the function might take, you know, when you have a, a thing, it's all just basically the sort of cons cell with a tag on it. That's it. And uh, the functions they have, they hesitate between different representations, and I had to sort all that out. It'd be fun to see this in Jupiter. I, I don't know enough physics to say, it sure seems to me like the system would be good for quantum mechanics as well, because there's all this Hamiltonian stuff, operators, and a lot of algebra. And so, uh, you know, I, I should take some questions. I wanted to show you one weird trick, and then I'll shut up. Okay? You may have noticed that, you know, the, the expansion for e to the x as a series looks a lot like the expansion for the Taylor series of any given function. That's sort of not a coincidence. That happens because e to the x is its own derivative. Well, what if we rewrote this expression just a little bit? As you look at the Taylor series on the second line there, you see h squared over 2 times f double prime. So it sure looks like when you have h squared, you have the second derivative. And when you have h cubed, you have the third derivative, and so on. Using our d notation, I could pull the derivative out and h, and I could say, OK, great. What's really happening at each step is I'm multiplying h two times, and I'm differentiating twice, or multiplying by h three times and differentiating three times. So we could call that the operator hd. And indeed, a, an operator that is, just has a name in this system means multiply by me. And we already know the d operation is differentiation. And again, we win when we can postpone application. So in the fourth line there, if I pull the application of the function to x all the way out, then I'm left with an infinite sum of functions as a Taylor series. And if we also were to agree that um, hd to the 0 power was the identity operation, then I could write this as a pure power series of functions, which is what we can do there. 
And in fact, that thing in red, the power series of functions, we're going to define that as being e to the operator. So you can take any operator and you can take, and you can find e to the operator and it will generate that power series. So does this work? Yes, it does. I've multiplied the symbol h by the differentiation operator. I exponentiated it. I applied it to the tangent function. And then we apply all that to zero. And what do you get? You get the Taylor series of tan at the point zero. Any questions?